Good evening and welcome to the Murfreesboro City Board of Education meeting. Would we please all stand for the Pledge of Allegiance and a moment of silence. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. You may be seated. Good evening to all. Uh, if I could entertain a motion for the approval of our t agenda for tonight. So moved. Second. There's a motion and a second. All in favor, sign of aye. Aye. Thank you. Good evening, Dr. Gilbert. Hello, Chairman Wade. How are you doing? Wonderful. Thank you. <laughs> Good. You have several communications. First, I'd like to remind you that your school board retreat will be May the 5th from 8 o'clock until 3 o'clock at the Central Administration Building. We'd also like to congratulate the chair, Mary Wade. She was recently recognized by the first African Americans in the history of Murfreesboro as being the first African American female to be elected to the Murfreesboro City School Board. So congratulations. <laughs> And at this time, I'd like to introduce Tim Glover and Kathy Farrell. I'd like for them to come forward, please. As you know, they are very involved with the Mobile Health Unit, and we certainly welcome you here tonight. Thank you, Dr. Gilbert. Chairperson Wade, it's good just to come back with you and kind of share some of our work. I'm kind of a high-level view guy, and I'll turn it over in just a moment to kind of the miracle worker, Kathy Farrell, with this. But... I have to say, you know, when we began uh, this effort a couple of years ago, it really was a courageous idea and vision of Dr. Gilbert. I had an opportunity to visit with Dr. Gilbert and Gary Anderson and just began this conversation about the needs and this vision of the whole child that extended to the whole family, that extended to the whole community. And you need to know that uh, though we may not be touching every child of Murfreesboro City Schools, we're certainly touching the most vulnerable and making a transformative difference. And this courageous vision that began with Dr. Gilbert has really grown to a national model. We are a learning model across the country uh, with this effort of mobile health, but particularly this collaboration with the school system. And so thank you, Dr. Gilbert, for this opportunity, uh, for this vision and this great work uh, that you have let loose Thanks, uh, Tim. You're a good work. friend. And to this body for your support in doing that. So real quickly, I'll let uh, Kathy Farrell, who's the coordinator uh, of this collaborative and effort, to kind of share with you some of the impact that, that we're doing within Murfreesboro City Schools. Thank you. Um, in honor of football or basketball this month, um, one of my favorite John Wooden quotes is never mistake activity for achievement. And I talk about that all the time in every kind of setting that I'm in and lead off with it. And it's because while I'm going to share with you some numbers and some statistics, what I really want you to walk away with is our achievement, our collective achievement, and a couple of stories of lives that we've really truly impacted, not just in that moment, but beyond that moment. And I think that's the beauty of this collaboration and that's why we do what we do. Um, so far, this fiscal year, I just got the final total today, from July 1 of 2011 through, the, uh, through today, through this day in March, the 27th, we have had 2,413, let me say that again, 2,413 patient encounters as a result of this collaboration. Um, Primary Care and Hope Clinic has 554. The Guidance Center, 931 patient encounters. That includes um, intake appointments, the first appointment, follow-ups, med management, and case management appointments. Um, St. Thomas Emergency Services drives for us. Yes, I don't drive the big rig anymore. Mm -hmm. um, and they're also EMTs. And so they're on that unit, able to do blood pressure checks and glucose checks for us. Um, just those guys have had 250 patient encounters. That could be an adult walking up to the unit. That could be a teacher inside of a building who maybe struggles with diabetes and forgot their glucometer at home and just needs us to run a check for them. Um, St. Thomas Corporate and Community Medicine partners with us once a month. Yesterday we also partnered with the mobile mammography unit and saw almost 90 people at Habitat for Humanity in four hours. Um, they have totaled on 443 screenings. Now that touches your parents. 
you all in Rutherford County Schools and various nonprofits in the community let us kind of share our information. Well, Rover copies our flyers and hangs them on the bus. So we're trying to reach the uninsured, the most vulnerable, and I think the parents, that's a huge piece of this because we have those babies for a while, but they go home. And that environment makes a difference in how they perform in school as well. Um, and just my piece, and I think this was kind of born last year, and I have to recognize a couple people back here that I kind of asked to come. Um, Tanya Hobbs, you all know her, and Maricela Tapia, without these two people, nothing that we do would be possible at all. Tanya and her fleet of social workers um, <laughs> link us with the people that really need us the most, both from a physical and a mental health or behavioral health perspective. And Maricela, I, I don't even, where do I start? I mean, I, she's the Pied Piper of the Hispanic community, <laughs> truly. I've heard that before from Dr. Gilbert. Um, and I want to tell you that she's so good about connecting us with volunteers. We have a translator on staff now, um, actually employed through the Guidance Center, and she comes with us to some of the monthly events, medical events as well. She's a parent at one of our schools. She got her GED last year. Maricela recommended her to us as a volunteer, and now she's employed. That's huge. That's a victory in and of itself. Um, but kind of out of these partnerships and having people refer folks to me, I have 235 people. Um, that I've worked with as well. So 2,413, that's huge. Kind of two of the stories that I want you to take away, um, one from John Pittard and one from Northfield. Because we're outside of Bradley, we're outside of John Pittard, but those, these families use us sometimes when we're at Laverne, sometimes when we're in Smyrna, at these monthly events as well. Just because we're not outside of their building doesn't mean that they don't come to us. Um, John Pittard, we went um, the day that the county schools were closed. We had the option to not run that day, but we decided it was safe. Guys felt safe about driving, so we went. We met a family that had just moved here from Indiana. Completely uninsured, very vulnerable situation. We went ahead and absorbed the cost because we have a grant that Tim wrote through Ascension that lets us offset the expense of the uninsured for both services. Um, came on board the unit, paid for the immunization and physical so they could start school right away, would not miss any instruction time. But we sat down with them because we always want to know, what's your situation? Are you employed here? You're going to apply for TIN care? Will you have insurance through your job? So we navigated them through the applying for TIN care process. Two weeks later, both girls were sick, came back to us again, and the TIN care had already been approved. Again, we helped them in that moment, and they didn't miss any instruction time, but we helped them for the future, too. Um, the second story with Northfield sports physicals. So there's a little boy who has a very kind of tenuous home situation, and Christy Knitter is fantastic, too. Um, Christy contacted us, could you absorb the cost for the sports physical, of course. We're not going to let that be a barrier for a child participating in athletics. Um, so got the paperwork to the family. Christy actually helped the family get to us at John Pittard, did the sports physical, and then and she emailed back, and I have to quote, um, we did the sports physical the day of the first game, by the way, for him. And he scored that night, and he told her that he felt like a new person. That was a direct quote from that child. So um, thank you all for the opportunity. We look forward to the future. We want this to continue. We're so grateful for you all, for Dr. Gilbert's vision, for putting me into this role. Really, I'm very grateful for you. And we want to make sure that we continue this collaboration in the future. Yes, do you have any questions? Are, are we on board to continue this for the next school year? Going forward, we um, right now we are um, our memorandum of understanding goes through July the 27th. We need to go on and renew that so that we can get the schedule in place and do kind of the future planning. So. What do you have to do to renew? I just need uh, this lady right here to review it and everybody to sign it. <laughs> I would assume that's going to happen, but I don't know. But let's hope so. Thank Sounds you. Sounds like a very good program. Well, well again, we're just really grateful to be able to join Murfreesboro City Schools in this tremendous uh, vision and Dr. Gilbert and, and her, her staff and uh, uh, institutions and uh, and again, as Kathy said, you know, we're really changing the wholeness of children and their families and bridging them into resources, whether it's behavioral health resources, a medical home, social service needs and agencies and resources, helping the school address uh, some of the coordinated school health uh, goals and achievements there, 
uh, helping that child to be healthy so they can then be a productive student. Um, again, we're, we're very proud to be able to do that. Mr. Washington, hello. How are you doing? Good. You good? I wanted to say something. Ms. Farrell, Ms. Tapia, Ms. Hobbs, and <laughs> Mr. Glover, you all, thank you so much for your work and your leadership and touching so many lives and, and making thank such you. a real difference for our children and our families. I don't know how to say it. You know, just wow. It's amazing to hear the stories. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you so Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Keel. Thank you very much, folks. And I'd, I'd, like, to, sure. I'd sure. like to thank you, too. And, and you know, I, I hear from other friends and kind of dif different avenues about what a difference um, you all have made in, in the lives of families. And I really appreciate what you all do. I don't think any of us here begins to understand how much Middle Tennessee Medical Center does for our community, and, and we have Tim to thank for helping us out in Bershiba Springs, too. They do an awful lot of, um, of, of things for many groups that you'll never hear about. This is something that's really big and right in our community, and I, I think you know, everyone should appreciate this as a huge thing, but I, I want to thank you all for everything that you do. Thank you. Really very appreciative of that, and and thank you, ladies, for all you do just day in and day out for um, all kinds of people in Murphy's for all children, parents, grandparents. It's really um, awesome what you're doing, and that's, that's what um, being a community is about. I really think here in Murfreesboro we have some of the best connections between all kinds of groups, the hospital, um, the federal agencies, the school systems, many nonprofits. It, it's really, um, uh, you know, it should be copied everywhere in the country. And um, we have been, we have received national awards for what we've done. Um, and, and Linda's an excellent example of someone who's helped put this all together. She worked on that before she was um, back with the school system, too. She's been very involved with this from um, several years ago. But we have a lot to be proud of in our community. And uh, we're, on, we're on a roll. We just got to keep it going. And I'm sure we're going to get this memorandum signed. And we'll have, we'll have MTMC support, I'm sure. And uh, we really appreciate all that you do. This is a great place to live. Tim, I will say this. Uh, you, you remember the first meeting we had to restart this operation at, at your old office? And yes, sir. Dr. Gibbard really was the one that initiated that. And, uh, it's, it's a prize thing in my service to, to have been in that meeting and try to get it restarted. And, and I'm, I'm, it's going exactly the way that we envision, I believe. And I appreciate that. From your hospital and from you. Appreciate your leadership mm -hmm. and your involvement. No problem. No problem. Thank you. It's hard to say no to Linda. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> and uh, when she comes with such a transformative vision, uh, uh, again, we're, we're seeing that happen. And uh, so, again, we're grateful to this body uh, for the tremendous support. And, and it is a community effort. And uh, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. I have, as an old school teacher, I told Gary um, Anderson that old habits die hard. I have some handouts for you all. <laughs> but I'm going to leave with Linda Ridley, if that's okay. We have a brochure and then a schedule. Just I thought you all might want to see that as well. Okay. Okay. Linda can pass them out. She'll be good at that. <laughs> Thank you so much for being here tonight. Thanks. Good to see you. Uh, oh, no, I was to keep Does the bus have a name? Because we ought to call it Resurrection. I'm, we resurrected I don't know whether we've ever named the. <laughs> Does it have a name yet? <laughs> I think I think Kathy called it a lot. Kathy's called it a lot of things, especially when she was driving it. <laughs> Maybe we should let the kids name it. <laughs> That's a great That's a idea. idea. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. We'd like to congratulate the 2012 Murfreesboro City School Art winners, and you have the listing in your packet. But particularly, I'd like to point out best of show was Sebastian Sands, who was a sixth grader at Black Fox. The best teacher was Kim Garrett from Black Fox, and the best school was Black Fox. So I think Channel 3 has been running the art show and, and some pictures on there, but, but we w did want to bring that to your attention. I haven't seen that. 
We would also con like to congratulate Discovery School's fifth grade student, Evan Smart, who won first place in the Colonel Hardy Murphy chapter of the DAR American History Essay Contest. His essay was titled James, For James Fortin and I, and it will now go to district level competition. So congratulations to this student from Discovery School. Northfield Elementary is proud to announce that Cynthia Yu, who is a sixth grader in Ms. Sharon Arnett's class, won the state award for a DAR-sponsored poster contest. The theme of the contest was Andrew Jackson and the Tennessee Volunteers and the War of 1812, and Cynthia will be recognized at the state DAR luncheon, which will be on March the 31st of 2012. And at this time, I would like to ask Greg Lyles to come, please, to the podium, and he does have some guests, and we'll talk with you about the next items. Thank you. Ladies, would you join me? Just to reemphasize the fact that we are fortunate as a school district to have so many community partners. It's unbelievable. I mean, you ask somebody uh, in the community about something we're doing to partner with us, and they're always ready uh, to help us in any way they can. Um, and I'd like to recognize some of those organizations that have helped us with our backpack program, which was started in the city, I guess, about three years ago, possibly, I believe, around three years ago. Uh, we partner with the Second Harvest Food Bank and provide backpack food for our children to take home on the weekend. And since this program has started, I would, I remember we have doubled the number of students that we serve. We are now serving about 218 students per week and providing them with backpack food to take home on the weekend. And this is possible through the efforts of many of our partners. Uh, we'd like to recognize First Baptist Church on Main Street, New Vision Baptist Church, First United Methodist Church, and Bethel United Methodist Church, who have recently made financial donations to our backpack program. But we have some very special guests here uh, with us this evening from Middle Tennessee State University who is one of our outstanding community partners. Uh, a few months ago I received a call to, uh, from Dr. Gilbert to go to MTSU to uh, receive a donation on behalf of our backpack program. And at that point I met um, Dr. Uh, to Beth Emery, who is a professor in the Department of Human Sciences at Middle Tennessee State University, Ms. Stephanie Bush, who is an instructor in that department, and I also met Deborah Belcher, who is department chair, and uh, met an outstanding student who is seated at the table here in front of us, Jennifer Austin. And Jennifer is going to talk about the effort, uh, a program that she developed at Middle Tennessee State University and uh, through her efforts they donated the Murfreesboro City Schools $660 for our backpack program and so Jennifer at this time I'm going to let you tell us about how your program came about. Uh, Thank you. Um, this past fall uh, for my major I was required to do a 100 hour internship and I wasn't quite sure what I wanted to do. And um, the opportunity presented itself to work with uh, Dr. Emery and Ms. Bush um, for the MTSU chapter of Universities Fighting World Hunger. And um, I absolutely jumped at the chance to work with them. Uh, they are amazing. And um, I was already familiar with Universities Fighting World Hunger through a course that I had taken um, in the spring of 2011. And in this course, we raised awareness campus-wide um, and community-wide to the issues that our children face locally um, dealing with hunger. And um, so we raised awareness and we also um, did some fundraisers as well. And um, all the money that we raised was donated to the backpack program um, of Murfreesboro City Schools and also Wilson County Schools. So I was already familiar with uh, Universities Fighting World Hunger and the work that they do, which is amazing. And so I thought, you know, this is exactly what I would like to do. Um, for my internship, uh, my, my main goals 
were to uh, really, again, bring awareness, the exact same thing that we did in my class, um, educate my fellow students, faculty, and um, also plan a fundraiser to raise money uh, for the backpack program. And so after, it feels like, weeks of research, trying to find the perfect fundraiser and something that I thought that we could really accomplish in a short amount of time, um, I came up with a change drive. And um, it was titled Feed a Child, Feed a Dream. And um, Feed a Child, Feed a Dream was, you know, in the, in the form of a spare change drive. Um, we set up the week before Thanksgiving, our Thanksgiving break. Uh, we collected change. Um, we went to different classrooms in the Department of um, Human Sciences as well as uh, the Department of Health and Human Performance. And we actually were able to go in and speak to different classrooms. And it was amazing because we were really given the opportunity to grab their attention um, and not have to fight for their attention. We had their attention and we were able to present the facts, the st statistics, and just really bring awareness to, um, I think, what's overlooked um, within our own community. Uh, when when you think of hungry children, you think of it happening millions of miles away when really it's the child next door. And, um, and so, you know, to bring awareness to the fact that a child dies from hunger every six seconds and hunger kills more than AIDS, tuberculosis, and malaria combined. I mean, these are statistics and facts that, you know, that affect us locally as well as globally, world, worldwide. So um, that's what we did. We collected change. MTSU was absolutely amazing. They were so giving. The students were incredible. The faculty, uh, everything I did would not have been able, I would not have been able to do any of it without the Department of Human Sciences and their support. Um, and as I said, MTSU, um, they were amazing. And we ended up, um, you know, making over $1,300 in spare change. And so it was really an eye opener. And um, it was life changing for me in more ways than one. So, um, and it was really important, I think, that we tried to stress feed a child, feed a dream. We kind of titled it that way because um, we all know without, you know, proper food, without uh, nutritious meals, children cannot grow and learn as they need to. And so I challenged MTSU to um, inspire dreams within the children in our own community. And so um, it was truly amazing, and we definitely did our job. So thank you. Thank you. I can't thank you enough for this thank ministry, you. actually, that, that you've had and, and the vision that you've had in, in your project. I love the theme. I, th I think that is wonderful. Thank you. And you're a good example for others. And I, thank you very thank much you. for your good work. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jennifer. Really appreciate thank that. And, and friends from MTSU, thank you so much. Thank you very much. We look forward to our continued thank partnership. You. Thank you, Jen, for being here tonight. Thank you. Where is she from? Where is Jennifer from? Jennifer, where are you from? In Cowan, Tennessee. I know exactly where Cowan is. Yeah. Doc Cowser used to live in That's Cowan. That's right, Dr. Cowser. Yes, ma'am. He's, he's well, I, mean, I think it's great that you came to Murfreesboro to go to school and you did such a fabulous project for Murfreesboro and you're not from Murfreesboro. I think that speaks highly of you. Thank you so much. And I particularly like the idea of challenging MTSU to encourage children's dreams locally. I just think that's such an important idea. I really loved it. So. Thank you. We really hope to continue it and, and make it um, just expand. I mean, uh -huh. great. Great. MTSU is such a large campus and like I said, the support was outstanding, and so we can we hope to continue it every year and just keep, you know, keep making contributions whenever possible. So, thank you. And Jennifer Austin's a great name. We have a fabulous teacher. <laughs> That's right, <laughs> <laughs> Jennifer Austin. 
<laughs> yes, I someone like asked it a lot. me tonight. <laughs> yeah, well, thank, thank you, Jennifer. You. Thank really you. appreciate you being here. Thank you. I, I do have one more announcement, and, and I apologize for it not being on your agenda, but really we found out for sure about it this afternoon, although I got a phone call a few weeks ago, but the connection was not made with the school until this afternoon. And in way of introduction, I think probably the best way to talk about this is to share the email that Barbara Sales sent out. So Barbara doesn't know that I'm doing this, so if you're watching Barbara, I'm sorry. But, but I think it's important for you to hear what she said. This was sent to her faculty this afternoon. In my tenure at Hobgood, I have received two phone calls that just gave me shivers. The first one was when we were named the National Title I Distinguished School for the State of Tennessee, and the other one was today. I just got a phone call from a man with Education Consumers Foundation Group. He informed me that Hobgood was being honored as one of nine elementary schools in the state of Tennessee for having tremendous value-added achievement results. They shared that this year we rank 13th in the state among 752 schools, with big exclamation points after that. <laughs> he also shared that we rank second among all schools in Middle Tennessee. They named nine principals from the elementary schools across the state and nine principals from middle schools. Thanks so much for your part in having me, Barbara Sales, named one of those principals. On May 14th, there will be 18 principals from across the state of Tennessee honored at the Tennessee Supreme Court at a special ceremony. I will proudly go and represent you and all the wonderful things you do each day to positively affect our students, our district, and our school. Congratulations. You guys deserve all the accolades and recognition that is coming your way. Please take the time to thank your colleagues as you see them in the halls or other places for being the dedicated professionals who take this business of educating students to exceptionally high levels. This award is the result of assembling the best educators who truly believe all students can learn and who employ the best practices each day. Thanks so much, Barbara Sales. So we want to congratulate her and congratulate Hobgood. That is quite an honor. I'm just so proud of Hobgood. I have been for years, and uh, Barbara Sales is an incredible leader. Her teachers love working there. She has, um, I think teachers do end up in the places that they're meant to be a lot of times, and the teachers that are at Hobgood now, they are on a mission. They work hard. They know that they're, they're going to school. They're going to work hard and they're gonna make a difference with those children. And I am so proud of each and every one of the teachers over there and proud of Barbara Sales for the kind of leadership that she's provided for years. I, I'm, I'm just, I've got a little special place in my heart for Hobgood and when I go off the board, it's not going away. <laughs> Yeah. Really proud of them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's quite an exceptional honor, and I, I'm thrilled that that they received that. Uh, the gentleman had called me about a week ago. And we've been playing phone tag, and so I talked to him early this morning, and I wrote her and I said, "You're going to have a surprise today. I've got to be at the State Department, but I want to I want to congratulate you." She wrote me back. And she said, "You want to share that surprise?" I said, "No, I think it's better if it comes from." <laughs> so when I got back this afternoon, then I found the email, and I thought it was a very fitting way to to announce their their award. And those are your communications. Thank you, Dr. Gilbert. We're down now to consent items. Is there a motion to approve the consent items? So moved. Is there a second? Second. There's a motion and a second. All in favor, sign of aye. Aye. Thank you. Action items? Okay, the first item you have before you is um, school board policy IS-9 school trips. It's before you for first reading. This is a rewrite of our school um, policy that deals with field trips. Um, the field trips um, have been broken into three categories. First, you um, have a field trip that is travel within the same day and limited to a radius of 150 miles. Those trips are going to require the approved off-campus trip approval form. Ne the next category of school trips would include competitions or performances. 
Those are trips made on a scheduled basis, and they are an integral part of an ongoing operation of an authorized program. Some examples of a competition or performance would include athletic contests, music competitions, quiz bowls, the Science Olympiad, the uh, robotics program, math contests. Um, competition and performances that do not involve overnight stays or travel in excess of 150 miles will not be considered a field trip and will receive um, blanket approval of the director and the board when program guidelines and schedules are approved. And, but if a competition or a performance involves an overnight stay, it would fall into the category of an excursion and that will require an off-campus trip approval form and it will need to, they, it will also include a notarized travel permission and emergency medical release form. The third category of school trips would include an excursion. An excursion is defined as travel that involves either an overnight stay and or excess of 150 miles travel. Um, some examples of an excursion would include the land be between the lakes trips or trips to um, Chattanooga to the aquarium or trips to um, the Huntsville um, Space Center. Um, these trips will require an off-campus approval form and notarized travel permission and emergency medical release forms. And students are not to be penalized for um, not participating in an optional excursion. The policy also includes factors that should be considered when um, a teacher or a principal are determining whether or not to um, take a certain type of school trip. They need to consider the value of the activity to the particular class or group of students. They need to consider the relationship of the school trip activity to the particular aspects of classroom instruction, the suitability of the activity and the distance traveled in terms of the age level, and the mode and availability of Murfreesboro City School Board approved transportation and the cost of the trip. Um, circumstances may exist when a principal agrees to authorize more than two school trips um, per year um, during an, a school year. So principals will have that discretion to approve more than two school trips during a year. Um, the, the policy also includes guidelines for planning and conducting the field trips, such as receiving the teacher receiving advanced approval from their principal. They need to be sure to have a definite purpose, purpose and carefully plan the trip. Um, a fee will be associated if a school bus is taken, and uh, those fees are designed to cover the cost of the driver. And um, they have to be sure that they obtain the necessary signed parental permission forms. And those parental permission forms are going to be required regardless of the distance um, the trip takes from the school. If it goes off campus, then a permission form is going to be needed. And they would need to take into um, consideration if a trip is taken outside normal school hours, it would re require the approval of the director or the director's designee at least 20 working days prior to the trip. Now, of course, if a s special circumstance comes up, there will be leeway for approval with less than the 20 days notice. Um, School-sponsored trips that are outside normal school hours, the chaperones um, will need to comply with the school volunteer policy that the board has previously approved and the associated administrative directives. And um, it, the groups um, need to be accompanied by at least one regular staff member. And if they are trips that are going to involve um, overnight stays, you need to have a female and a male chaperone for mixed groups. And students, of course, are not to be penalized for participating in the school trips. They should be allowed to make up any work that they miss due to taking the trip. And accidents that occur on the trip have to be reported um, through our normal procedures to the principal. And any school-sponsored trip not meeting the educationally beneficial criteria as defined in the section have to receive approval from the director or the director's designee. 
and um, any school-sponsored trip which is overnight or outside of the state must receive prior approval of the board and the director. Um, then um, some other factors that are set forth in the policy is by September 15th of each year, each school needs to submit to the director a list of their proposed overnight or out-of-state field trips. And um, if a special circumstance does arise throughout the course of the year, of course, arrangements can be made to seek approval of those trips. And finally, trips planned by parents or teachers for students during after school hours which have not received the approval of the principal and the director shall not be Murfreesboro City School Board approved field trips even if the information concerning the trip refers to a school by name or is made available in a school. And no employee shall state or imply that a trip is an authorized field trip if it has not been approved according to the policy. And the Murfreesboro City School Board shall have no responsibility or liability for any trip that has not received appropriate um, authorization. And that is the revised school trip policy. I move we approve. Ms. Smith has a question. Now, I just want to tell you, I, I'm very pleased with the changes that have been made. Um, I've had several people call me, actually, about the field trip policy. And um, one thing that I think it does is that it helps shape guidelines for teachers in planning field trips. Um, and it, but it does give great flexibility. Yes, it would be great to have our field trips planned at the beginning of the year. But again, you can apply to have a field trip later in the end of the year. Um, and it also gives some flexibility in that you may have more than two field trips a year. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I appreciate the rewrite on that. And parents have been asking about, about that. And, and I, I would say that I definitely want children to take field trips because it benefits their educations um, in the real world. Are there any other comments or questions for Ms. Baker? Ms. Renier? Ms. Baker, you've done a tremendous job, as Ms. Co as Ms. Co as Ms. Smith said, um, with the rewrites, because we did spend a lot of time on this policy. And I was going back to line 80 and 81, about the 20 days before, before um, a field trip notification. Let me see where it is. The trips taken outside normal school hours must be approved by the director or designate a minimum of 20 working days prior to the trip. And I was concerned that maybe we needed to write in whenever possible, but I think that that was addressed then down here. Oops, let me find it. In lines, um, I think it's 121 and 122, so that the director can then take care of it. So that was something that I, I hope that the teachers will take note of so that they realize that it can happen. Uh, I think the good example would be some kind of competition if they had to turn around and go for another, like this basketball tournament, go for their next session or whatever. It would be less than 20 days. So I think it's covered perfectly here. Thank you so much. Ms. Phillips, you still want to go with your motion? Yes, I still move that we approve um, the school field trip policy IS-9. Is there a second? Second. So I just have a quick question. Okay. So you're fine with the way it reads yes. now? Yes. And, and, feel, and you feel that that, and that is under overnight or out of state field trips? Do you feel like that's going to be? Well, I think or that, let's go back up here. You said 120. Line 80, 81. Yeah, on the, the one that, yes. On the competitions and performances, some of those it says, <clears throat> pardon me, <clears throat> possibly in excess of 150 miles or whatever, anything like that that might occur. Uh -huh. I, I think because of lines 121 or 122, whatever that was, I think it's, I think it's taken care of. Okay. Well, overnight or out of state. 
And also, if you look in lines 110, it, the, it, it gives the director discretion to make exceptions Experience. to the timeline requirements um, in special circumstances, such as term, tournaments requiring overnight stays. There it is. Perfect. Perfect. Very good. If there are no more questions, we shall. All in favor of the approval, say aye. 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 Are there any that oppose? Thank you, Ms. Baker. Now the next policy before you on first reading is board policy SS9, child nutrition management. And um, I will defer to Gary to discuss this. There's been a lot of information shared with you regarding this policy as well as um, administrative directives that will be prepared um, in, in conjunction with this policy. Uh, board policy SS9, as you know, was changed last June, and we've reviewed it again after our audit with the uh, U uh, USDA. They had made the uh, notification to us that we needed to change from the person in control of school principal to be supervisor of child nutrition. We have rewritten it to indicate that, and one other change in it is, is on page 2, which is on line 43 that lunch service on half days and field trip days will not follow the offer versus serve option for grades K through 6. That is just so we can have sack lunches and things kids can pick up and go. Those are the two main changes. At our last meeting, you had asked for information about this as far as uh, put together an administrative directive, and I believe Dr. Gilbert has forwarded to you a sample administrative directive that we would be uh, implementing uh, based on the uh, successful passage of this particular policy change. Uh, this is what the federal government has asked us to go forward and do, and we have put together this administrative directive. In addition to that, we sent you, just so you'll know that we are in line with other other school districts in the area, Other, uh, we provided some other board policies that are parallel with what we're saying in ours, and we just wanted to make sure you had that as to, uh, just evidence of what we're doing. So if anyone has any questions, I'll be glad to answer them about the policy. I move we pass SS9. Is there a second? Second. There's a motion and a second for the approval. All in favor, sign of aye. Comment? Question. Thank you, ma'am. <clears throat> As you know, I've been a strong proponent one way in this, and I do think that the administrative directive takes care of all that, and it does make sure that the principal of the building is involved in aspects of the school food service so I thank you very much for yes, sir. the administrative directive and getting that settled. You're welcome. Thank you. Are there any other comments or questions? Hearing none. There's a motion and a second. All in favor of the approval say aye. 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 If there are any that oppose say nay. Thank you. Just thank you. Okay, the next policy that you have before you for first reading is Board Policy IS-20, TCAP Security. This um, policy has been um, significantly revised to come into compliance with a state law, um, Tennessee Code Annotated 49-1-607. Um, do you have any questions or comments regarding this policy? Here none. Is there a motion for the approval? So moved. Second. There's a motion and a second. All in favor, sign of aye. Aye. Any opposed? Thank you. Okay, the next policy that you have before you for approval on first reading is board policy PER5, Equal Opportunity Employment. The only change that has been made to this policy is the addition of language or any other class protected by law. This was to help make sure this policy was broad enough to cover any future changes in federal or state law or constitutional law that would include other classes that would be protected. Do you have any questions or comments on this policy? Here enough. Oh. Thank you. Second? Second. There's a motion and a second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you. 
Okay, the next policy that you have before you in first reading is board policy PER6, staff rights and responsibilities. Here again, this um, the, the changes made to this policy you'll find in line 22 um, and 23. It had originally dealt, um, stated that a work environment free from sexual, racial, ethnic, and religious discrimination and harassment um, of any form, that has been revised to be more encompassing of all protected um, types of discrimination and har harassment under federal and state law to now read um, each staff member has the right to a work environment free from discrimination or um, harassment in violation of federal or state laws. So it's just broadened it to make sure it encompasses any discrimination or harassment prohibited under federal and state laws. Any questions or comments from Ms. Baker? I move we approve PR6, PER6. Is there a second? Second. There's a motion and a second for the approval. All in favor, sign of aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you. Okay, the next policy that you have before you for first reading is board policy PER8, credit for teaching experience outside of city schools. This policy has been rewritten. Um, previously, the um, school board had a cap on how much credit they would give someone coming to our school system for um, prior years of teaching experience. This policy now removes that cap and if Mr. Ringstaff has anything he'd like to add. <laughs> not, not unless there are any questions. Ms. Smith has a question, then Ms. Renia. It's not really a question, but I, I would like for y'all to share. Last, at our work session, uh, we asked for information on what other districts did with this. And I, I thought maybe if Dr. Gilbert or Mr. <coughs> Ringstaff could share that. Uh, I thought it was very informative. This, this process actually started back in 1994. <laughs> and uh, it was at that time requested by the Murfreesboro Education Association that every year that there would be another year added until it was completely deleted for whatever reason that stopped after 10 years. Um, so one of the things that, that I had done prior to requesting this was to talk with some of the teachers about him. Uh, but in addition, we also reviewed what was happening in other school districts. Ralph received the information from various school districts. The vast majority of school districts do not limit prior experience. Uh, for example, Franklin Special, Greenville City, Jackson Madison, Kingsport City, Lebanon Special, Lenore City, Morgan County, Putnam County, Rutherford County, and, and so forth. You do have a very few Shelby County will limit to 10 years and Hamilton to 15. The comment from uh, Metro Nashville was until about five years ago we limited new hire experience to 10 years. However, we felt the limit was hurting our recruitment of new teachers and they changed their policy. So I think it is very important. Um, I think this move is extremely important to us as a school district. I think it recognizes the value of teachers. Um, I think that it says that we in Murfreesboro understand that when a teacher comes to us that her or his years of experience in other districts are as valuable to what they bring to us as as what they would bring to us if, if they were here. Um, and, and I think that it's just important to recognize this for the teaching profession. And also I think it certainly will help us as far as the hiring of, of excellent teachers because I think the teachers that we have in Murfreesboro City deserve to have uh, those new teachers to be as excellent as they possibly can be. And I think with the accountability that's now on the table for all teachers, I think it's critical that we, we get the absolute best and we recognize teachers for their experience they bring to us. Okay. Here's Rainier and then Ms. Phillips. Yes, thank you. Um, we had quite a great deal of discussion on this policy at our policy making meeting and I regret that we didn't make this move years ago for the teachers who were affected by it. Um, I think that the time has come that we need to join suit with the other surrounding school districts. I think it's very important for recruitment. Who am I to say Susie Jones moves in from Wisconsin and she's got 17 years of experience and her husband's been transferred or vice versa she's been transferred and he's moving in to teach why would we tell them you know we're going to limit your years of experience I 
started to think maybe we needed to cap it at 15 because our salary schedule stops at 15. However, again, who am I to say? I think we need to follow suit with the other school systems around us. I think this is an excellent policy. Again, I regret for the teachers that have been affected by this for the past many years that this hasn't been in place prior to this time, but we're going to be progressive and we're going to get this done, and I think this is an excellent policy for us. Thank you. Ms. Phillips? I believe that Metro changed their, their policy to where they gave year for year. Is that not right? Well, right? actually what they're doing now is they are absolutely year for year. So if they come in with 15, they've got 15. Okay. The, um, I wish Ms. Duggan were here because she brought before some valid points that, and I hate to try to paraphrase her, but I think that they had some validity. So I'd like to uh, do my best to, to share those. And that was that... Um, she had concerns, and I, and I share those concerns about do, doing away with any kind of cap or any kind of year-for-year -year trade on um, a, you, you teach a year, you gain an additional year of your service. Um, I, I hesitate because uh, I'm concerned of how the teachers who were denied this in the past um, will feel for us to ch suddenly, in one fell swoop, uh, change the policy that has been longstanding. Um, I want them to know that they were equally valued and how I wish we could go back and, and, and you know, retroactively pay them their, their, uh, their worth too. But of course we can't do that with budget concerns. But I do have concerns of how it will affect the teachers who were, um, who were denied their years of experience when they came into the system. So I wanted to raise that point. Another point I'd like to raise is I'd be interested in sharing with the community at large the financial impact we expect to have by by this change in our policy because I, I think, you know, we have to be very good stewards and that means, of course, more money and not just more money but also, you know, more, uh, more the more benefits too as, they, as the years experience. And these, we have to be good stewards of our taxpayers' money and so we have to look at the whole overall financial impact to the system. And I just have to say, you know, I don't think we've had a hard time filling our classrooms with teachers. We have excellent teachers. And um, so I just want us to be very conservative when it comes to, to dollars and at the same time um, validating the teacher's worth and her experience as she comes into our city school system. So those are some thoughts I wish to share, and I appreciate you all listening. Dr. Andrews. Um, I, I think that you make valid points, and Mrs. Duggan did also. Um, I think the bottom line is what's going to be best for the children in the classroom. I think that that's going to be for us to have the best teacher that we can find to hire. That, I mean, that, that's, that's the bottom line. And if we don't um, give them the years of experience and they end up going to another system and we really needed that veteran teacher for a certain class level at, a, um, at one of our schools, um, we've not helped our children in the classroom. Um, I, I hope all of our teachers understand, and I believe you may have come and not gotten all of your credit. Correct. Um, Mrs. Rainier, she did not get all of her credit. And, you know, there are some people who, who may be feel a little bit hurt, and there will be others that will think that, well, you know, I'm glad they finally straightened that out. At least it will be good for the next people that come, you know. Um, so I, I think the bottom line, when you look at, at any decision, it's got to be what's best for the children in the classroom. I think this is best for the children in the classroom, and I understand their valid points that might make us want to decide differently. But we've got to do best for our kids. That's the bottom line. So um, I'd like to move that we pass this as it is. I second it. Mr. Wing, staff, and then Ms. Phillips. Ms. Ms. Phillips mentioned the financial impact. Two years ago, in the year 2010, 2011, it would have cost the system $19,000 more in teacher salaries. And for this school year, it would have cost us 11000 more. May I respond to this? It's directed towards me. Um, thank you, Mr. Ringstaff. I appreciate that. Now, when you say that in salaries, does that include the overall, all, like, benefits and everything as well, the, the financial impact, including not just salary but benefits? 
I'm unsure what your mission benefits, medical insurance. Yes, retirement, medical insurance, all that stuff. All that would have been the same. That's all that in, was in the 19,000? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Now, do you think that because of the standing policy, perhaps it um, discouraged hiring teachers from different systems? In other words, do you expect that impact to rise? <coughs> if it, with the policy change, would you expect that impact to be greater? Yes, ma'am. I know of one teacher that has 17 years experience that we would really like to get mm -hmm. that a principal says that that teacher is dynamic but will not come with the current policy. Right. right. And I think the other thing that we have to remember is that with the tenure law changing, um, the influx that we would have gotten before we are not going to see because if a, if a teacher has tenure in Rutherford County or Wilson County, they're basically giving up that property right to come to us. So I think that the whole... Um, the whole recruitment process that we go through, the the whole uh, pool of teachers that we will receive will be a very different, we'll have a very different look to it because of that. That's an excellent point. Mm -hmm. Ms. Smith? I think we need to do this. It, we have a wonderful pool of fresh new teachers, but they need mentors. And as a parent in the school system, I really would like to see some teachers, I mean, 15 years experience, that is wonderful, but that if you could have teachers with 30 years experience, which I would even love even more. So I really think this is a true benefit to our school children. Mr. Cam. I agree. I think the, <clears throat> the policy has been with Mercer City for years. I know back to 1967 when I started teaching. But also we need to remember as well, and I'm all for giving teachers what they deserve and they deserve more than they get. But you got to remember, money doesn't always buy the best teacher. Mm -hmm. Just because a teacher's got 15 or 20 years experience in today's world does not make that teacher the better teacher than the one that's got a year or two experience. That's true. So, but I think this is well done. I think we should have done it a long time ago. There is a motion. Is there a second? Second. I second it. There's a motion and a second. All in favor? Sign of aye. 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 Are there any that oppose? Thank you. Okay, the next policy you have before you for first reading is board policy PER 23, employee names and addresses. The revisions to this policy were made to ensure that we're in compliance with the Tennessee Open Records Act. Under the Tennessee Open Records Act, certain information in an employee's personnel file is deemed confidential. And you're, you'll see there through lines um, 7 through 17, it lists out the items that are confidential in an employee's personnel file under the Tennessee Open Records Act. That would include an employee's home telephone number and their personal cell phone number, an employee's bank account and individual health savings account information, retirement account and pension account information, um, any of their financial records of the employee that show amounts and sources of contributions to accounts, and um, also their residential street address, their social security number, and their driver's license, if a driver's license is not required as part of their job. Um, so the policy has just been um, revised a little bit to make sure that it's clear what information has to be redacted if there is any public records request regarding an employee's personnel information. And it also references under the Tennessee Open Records Act, um, the Tennessee Office of Open Records Council has established a schedule of reasonable charges for copies of public records that um, governmental entities are um, to follow, and that is made an attachment to this policy. You'll see um, the attachments are from the Tennessee Office of Open Records Council that reference the charges for copies. Mr. Campbell. As teachers know, and I hope that members of the board realize too, there is a major discussion in the legislature today uh, even about whether or not test scores 
that a teacher's class has, whether or not they are open records as well. And I don't know, Kelly, whether that's possible, depending on what the legislature does, I guess, but uh, this is, what, first reading, right? So we may be able to go back, and if we want to, to adjust that to include, or does that need to come under something else? Well, if um, that information won't necessarily be included in their personnel file, I'm not sure where it would be included. But, of course, if the legislature passes the law making that information confidential, we would need to pull this policy back up and make additional revisions. Um, But... If that that particular information references, of course, any children by name, students by name, then it's made confidential under the federal um, laws that protect educational records. It's called FERPA. Um, My understanding is that that, that those test scores will be available. Am I right? Ralph, I think. Ralph? Yes. Well, this this policy is employee names and addresses. There's another policy, personnel file. Okay. So this doesn't address that. But the other one would. Yes, sir. If need be. Okay. I'd, I'd just like to comment. It's because it is something that's so timely. Um, Mr. Campbell brought it up. I was thinking the same thing. Um, I, I think that it would behoove us to have Dr. Gilbert maybe in our name um, get in touch with our representatives and ask them to pass this legislation that would allow teacher evaluations to be confidential. I, I think it's really important. Um, our, we want people to go into teaching. The people that need to know what those evaluations are will be the teacher, the principals, the director of schools. Um, they need to know. They're the ones that are going to work with this teacher. But you know, I, I don't want everyone to see in the paper um, every so often, every three months or every year, you know, what my, what my evaluation was. I, I really just don't think that's right, and, and I do think that we should support the governor in this and, um, and should ask our uh, legislators to, to back us up. I understand that, you know, the sunshine law, the press, they want to have everything out there, but I just don't think that's practical. I think it would encourage people who are really good teachers not to go into teaching or if they you know had one bad evaluation and it gets in the paper they might want to just quit Mm -hmm. and we could lose some good teachers that way Um, you know getting one bad evaluation doesn't mean you're a a bad teacher maybe you're a new teacher and you need to have some help or maybe something happened that was you know flawed the evaluation process but I I really think we should do that and and I know it's not on the agenda but I would like for us to consider um, if there's any way if we can Ms. Baker since it's a timely thing if we could ask Dr. Gilbert to do that for us? Is that possible? can do that tonight, as a matter of fact, yeah. when I get home, yes. It might be just as effective mm-hmm. yes. if you called your legislators. If all of us That's did. Right. I did that on Saturday. It wasn't about this issue, but we got into this mm-hmm. issue. Uh-huh. And go ahead, and everybody call, because it's all this stuff is going before committee now to be set on an agenda when they come back into session again and mm-hmm. community time is just about over. Okay. If you all would like to under other business, thank you. We can bring it up then but we need okay. to stay on policy. Thank you. I'm sorry. No, you're fine. We just have a little spot other business. Okay. We'll bring it back up. Uh Miss Phillips and uh Miss Rainier. Uh, currently the way the law is currently what are parents able to do? I mean if if they, they they could walk in and ask to see a teacher's evaluation? Would you like to address that, Ralph? I, I, I can. Oh, as far as the TFAS scores, and, and really in my mind, I have a question of how protected they will be. Obviously, they're still protected, but the way the evaluation is constructed, you could figure it out. But I'll, Under I'll the old evaluation, the, the uh, scores were confidential. Right. So right now there's a large debate whether or not these new evaluation scores are open record are open open. so they so right now they're still protected Mm -hmm. yes but right now we're uh we don't have them 
Yeah. Okay. Okay, but the, but the principals are doing evaluations all the time. Yes, You're talking right. about yeah. okay. So we're talk, I'm not. Are you talking about the principal evaluations or the overall, summative evaluations overall. that would happen at the end of the year? Okay. That, those that, and with those summatives, you're going to have on there. There will be different different areas that are pulled. Your this quantitative and qualitative. Mm -hmm. I think, um, and then I will be quiet until other business. Um, but I think that. That it's my responsibility to hold principals responsible, to hold teachers responsible for what they're doing. Um, and if I'm doing my job, then it should be reflected in those test scores, and there should be no need for someone to have to go into somebody's personnel file and figure out what's happening. It should be quite evident in that classroom and quite evident with the scores. And I think there's real concern on the on behalf of all administrators and also of teachers, and rightly so, as far as what would be done with those scores with open records, and particularly in the way that the scores are constructed, because remember, not all of our teachers, in fact, over half of our teachers are not receiving scores that are truly their individual scores. They may be the scores, for example, our pre ks none of our teachers there at all mm -hmm. are receiving truly their scores. Mm -hmm. And so I think that that's a large part of the debate that's going on, and, and rightfully so. But right now, and this was something that Ralph and I had discussed because the word was out that, that they would not be published in the newspaper. And I followed up and I said, would you please ask the commissioner, though, if anyone can go in and, and ask for it with open record. And currently, my understanding is that that would be the case. And so that's the reason you have the legislative actions uh -huh. taking place now. Mm -hmm. Would that satisfy Ms. Rainier? I'll uh, table it until we have new business. Oh, all righty. Okay. Is there any other question? For Ms. Baker on PER 23. Yes, ma'am. I'll make a comment about this. I think that protecting a teacher's privacy is very important, yes. especially these very personal issues. And I think pursuant to TCA, anything that they're telling us to do is absolutely perfect, and you've done a good job. I think that's absolutely appropriate. Do you need a motion? Yes, ma'am. I'd like to move we pass this. Is there a second? PR ER 23. Seconded. There's a motion and a second. All in favor of the passing of this policy say aye. 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 Are there any that oppose? And for the sake of, we will go back under other business and we can have some discussion with Dr. Gilbert. Okay, the next policy before you for first reading is PER 24 relative to substitute teachers. Um, and I will defer to Mr. Ringstaff to discuss this policy. Thank you. This policy we're updating to, uh, which will adhere to the policies, procedures that we are currently working under. We recently, last year, went through a computerized software called Subfinder, which all a teacher has to do is call uh, into Subfinder, and that's um, computer software will obtain a sub for that teacher. So you will notice uh, throughout the policy that it uh, follows that particular guidelines. If you would turn to page two, I would like to make a change that's not noted on here in line 38 and 39. Retired teachers may substitute 120 days per year without loss of retirement benefits. The next is they may work the full school year if the director of schools certifies in writing to the State Board of Education that no other qualified personnel are available to perform such work. We want to walk, mark out to substitute teach because it not only applies to substitute teaching, but if we have a need for an ELL teacher and there is no one qualified that we can find, uh, Dr. Gilbert can certify to the State Board of Education that so-and-so who is retired, who is certified, uh, is the only one qualified, and that person can receive full retirement and be employed by the Murphy Pearl City Schools for the whole year. And we recommend uh, approval of this policy on first reading. So moved. Second. There's a motion and a second. Are there any questions? Hearing none, we'll take a vote. All in favor, sign of aye. Aye. Any opposed? Thank you. Okay, the next policy before you for first reading is PER 27, Tennessee Consolidated Retirement System. 
And again, I'll defer to Mr. Ring's staff to discuss this one. Thank you. The original policy gave a history of the TCRS. This will help teachers understand uh, Tennessee Consolidated Retirement System a little bit better. It explains it more thoroughly, and it is in conjunction. It uh, goes with the substitute teacher policy with the uh, wording on the retired teachers who are reemployed um, and so forth. We recommend approval of this policy on first reading. So moved. Second. There's a motion and a second. Are there any questions? Hearing none, all in favor sign of aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you. <clears throat> the next policy that you have before you in first reading is PER 32, Drug-Free Workplace. And again, I'll defer to Mr. Ringstaff. Thank you. We're going to update this policy. Instead of five days after conviction, and the employee should notify the supervisor within two calendar days. And also, we would like to include reasonable suspicion as one of the ways, uh, reasons why we would like to drug test. And we recommend approval of this policy on first reading. Ms. Rainier. I don't know, <clears throat> pardon me, I don't know if it's, if there's some legal reason, but if my child's teacher was arrested for drugs and it hit the paper and that person did not come clean, so to say, with their principal or the director of schools, I think I would be very upset. And so I'm just wondering if we could change this um, line 22 instead of saying that they have to notify their supervisor within two calendar days after conviction, could we change it to say after arrest? I don't know if there's a reason for this or not. Well, the reason for this particular section is every single federal grant that we receive requires mm -hmm. us to comply with the Federal Drug-Free Workplace Act of 1988. In that federal act, any grantee that's received federal money has to notify the federal granting authority within 10 days, calendar days, if you have an employee convicted of a drug-related offense. This particular clause is designed to help us meet that requirement, and um, there is nothing to require us to do more and make an uh, that would prohibit us from making an employee notify us within a certain amount of time of an arrest. Now, the only problem you run into with they notify you of their arrest is, of course, everyone's innocent until proven guilty. So that's why we w would wait until the conviction is w the conviction is what triggers our requirement to notify the, the government. federal government that's okay. given us any grant monies. Okay. So that's that's what that this particular clause is designed to help us comply with that federal requirement. Okay. Thank um, you. I know sometimes if an employee is arrested for a DUI or drug-related offense, some employers will require that employee to notify the employer of the arrest and keep the employer apprised of the process. And then once the employee is convicted is when the employer can take um, action relative to their job status. And some employers may put an employee on some sort of leave pending the outcome of the criminal matter. That's also an employer's option. But, of course, since you're innocent until proven guilty, that's part of the reason the conviction term is utilized. Dr. Andrews. Um, I'd like to suggest that you take this back and maybe work up something that would include um, being notified of arrest and, and uh, you mentioned some other employers did something along those lines. Maybe we could look at that. Um, I think we need to be aware when, when there has been some kind of arrest. I'm not sure that it needs to be just under um, drugs and alcohol. I think that, I don't know if we have something mentioned if someone's been arrested for you know, domestic violence or child or child molestation, or do we already have that if they're arrested for that? I think if someone has an arrest that 
we should be apprised of that. <laughs> I think we need to know because um, our employees are working for the public and um, we have a responsibility to keep our children safe. So I don't know if it belongs under this policy, but I, I think we do need a, a policy that would address those other issues as well. Okay. Mrs. Renia. I, I certainly agree with Dr. Andrews. I think if this is not the proper place, maybe we need one more policy. I think we need to have, I think it needs to be open to the, the, the principal, the immediate supervisor, Dr. Gilbert. Uh, anytime someone is arrested for any of the matters that have been brought about here, you know, we're entrusted with these children. That's our goal, take care of these children meet their needs every day and I just you know gosh if if my child was in somebody's room who had as Mr. Uh, Campbell said who had been arrested for domestic violence or or something else more horrible than that we certainly wouldn't would not necessarily want them in the classroom and we'd certainly want to be notified and it probably hit the newspaper right away, so we'd be notified very blatantly. But I think I think we need some kind of a policy. Okay. And I, I believe there's policies that we could work that revision into. Okay. That'd be great. Yeah, we don't we don't need to have a, a bus driver who's been arrested for um, alcohol DUI. We we don't need to have that person driving our school mm -hmm. kids or right. without really knowing what's going on. And of course, we still want to help anybody that has trouble, help them get get assistance and coming off of whatever substance they might be hooked on or whatever. Are there any other questions or discussion? Or is the wishes of the board to table this policy for Mrs. Baker to go back? Or you want to go ahead and approve it with revisions to follow? I think we can approve. Okay. Well, I'm sorry. May I speak? Yes, ma'am. I think we can approve what we have here for the um, to coincide with what Ms. Baker said about the federal grant, mm -hmm. and then work on another policy. So I would move to uh, to um, <laughs> accept this. <laughs> I'd like to just get Mrs. Baker's. Um, how how do you think we ought to handle that? Well, I. When I bring this back to you for second reading, I will include something to deal with notification of an arrest for a drug-related or alcohol-related offense okay. in this particular policy. Okay. Now, your concerns about any other sort of uh, offense, I can include, I need to go back and look, but I know we have policies that deal with standards of conduct or discipline policies. We could incorporate that type of requirement into one of those policies. It may already be included. I don't have that on the top of my head. So uh, how, so we can pass this pending the changes no. from you? And I'll bring back okay. the revised version for second reading. I'll second your oh, motion. <laughs> there's Do a motion that. and there's a second. All in favor of approval, sign of aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you. Okay, the next policy that you have before you for first reading is PER 35, Discrimination, Harassment of Employees. Again, as in the earlier policies I'd noted, this, um, some language has been um, removed and added to make sure that we're encompassing all forms of discrimination and harassment prohibited under federal and state law. Any questions for Ms. Baker? I move we approve PER 35, Discrimination, Harassment of Employees. Second. There's a motion and a second. All in favor, sign of aye. Aye. Any opposed? Thank you. Okay, the next policy you have before you is PER 41, Non-Renewal of Non-Tenured Teachers. The only change made to this policy is in line 15. The law has changed the date from May 15th to June 15th. I move we pass PER 41. There's a second. There's a motion and a second. All in favor, sign of aye. Aye. Thank you. Any opposed? Okay. The next policy that you have before you on first reading is board policy IS-15, state and federal education agency relations. Um, the recommendation is to delete this policy in its entirety. I move we delete 
IS 15. Seconded. There's a motion and a second. All in favor, sign of aye. Aye. Uh, thank you. Okay, the next policy that you have before you for review and first reading is board policy PER 37, non-renewal of non-licensed employees, and the recommendation is to um, delete this policy in its entirety because the law has changed non-licensed employees to at-will employees. So moved. Second. There's a motion and a second. Is there any questions? I have a question. Mrs. Phillips. Um, so a uh, at-will employee, is that what you called it, Ms. Baker? Yes. Um, do they have any recourse at all? They have recourse in um, the fact that if they believe the termination was based on um, violated a federal or state law, such as um, discriminatory termination, they could bring um, a complaint and in that fashion. Mr. Ringstaff, do you have anything to add? Yes, we, we have a procedure where it's a progressive discipline procedure that uh, there are no surprises uh, to an employee. We work with employees to succeed. So do they have evaluations and written, uh, written evaluations as far as, so they know what expectations, what the expectations are for the yes, job? Ma yes, ma'am. And so, okay. I like that. No surprises, you know. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. I move we delete PER 37. Second. There's a motion and a second. No more questions. <coughs> All in favor, sign of aye. Aye. Any opposed? Thank you. And the last policy before you tonight on first reading is board policy IS-10, community resource persons. Um, we're recommending to delete this policy in its entirety because it has now been replaced with um, board policy IS-10 entitled school volunteers. I move to delete IS-10. Thank what? you. Uh, Sorry. There's a motion and a second. All in favor, sign of aye. 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 Thank you. Reports and information. I'm going to turn that over to Mr. Anderson. Uh, the first report is on your finances, and we have good news as in business. They say we've crossed over into the black. Uh, we've finally, finally gone over and have more revenue versus expenditures at this time. As you know, the year started off sluggish on tax collections, but we are now up 81,000 over last year in our sales tax collections. And we had a big bump of 60,000 during the month of December, which really uh, shows the economy has started to pick up. Property tax collections are slightly behind, but we will still get another uh, two months of pretty strong collection rates. So we're, we're feeling pretty good about that. We're at the 66.7% of the year mark. And as always, our revenue lags a little bit behind at this time, but we're at 65.8, and so we're, we're, it's getting uh, better as we go along. We're just $2,500 below where we were last year at this time in, in collections, and with the economy picking up on sales tax, we're feeling pretty good about that. We did receive some growth money, that, that half of it that came in this particular uh, budget code under the state um, BEP. And it came in as about $300,000 received, which is about half of our growth money. Rest we'll get uh, in May. So we're feeling good about having that growth this year that helped us on our revenue side. On the expenditure side, uh, we are uh, at 64.8%. So we are below the uh, percentage of expenditures year to date. And we keep getting closer and closer to last year's number on that. So we're feeling good about that as well. Uh, so, is there any questions on the uh, financial review at this point? Okay, thank you. The next report is is on our uh, attendance numbers for the year and our enrollment numbers. Uh, we are oops, wrong page. We are 200 students over last year through the end of February, where we were, and we're 122 students over budget which is also a good thing for us. Our K-3 PTR ratio is 18.79. Our 4 through 6 PTR ratio is 20.57. Uh, we keep growing a little bit every month in our special ed for pre-K. We're up to 66 in February. It just grows one or two kids every month as they 
uh, come of age to get in our schools and identified. We have to uh, enter them in our pre-K. And our attendance information has, we, we hover constantly between 95 and 97 percent, which is excellent attendance rate in our schools. So um, that's, that's the report I have for you on where we are in our attendance at this time. Ms. Phillips? I think our mild winter may have helped with our yes, it did. attendance. <laughs> sure did. Yeah, the flu season is actually happening right now, but it seems very mild. Hmm. <coughs> The late flu season. As you go. I know, I know. Okay. Tiny. As I alluded uh, during the meeting about other business, there was a question about discussion. And Mrs. Baker, I may need some clarification. My thinking was when I said uh, we would bring, we were on po uh, policy PER 23, we already had this on the book tonight for a discussion. But our discussion leaned over into something we wanted to have a little more talk and address getting Dr. Gilbert to take care of some business for us with our legislature. So I wanted to make sure under other business we can go back to this policy for a little more discussion or should we table this to uh, or bring it up in our uh, policy session? Well, I, I interpreted the discussion to... Um segue into a request that Dr. Gilbert um, provide information to the legislature okay. relative to certain legislation that's currently passing through and um, if the board would like to discuss whether they would like a resolution or a letter on behalf of the board to go to the legislature or if individual board members want to contact them directly as opposed to a group contact that type of discussion okay. is appropriate for other business. Okay, so I will open other business up uh, pertaining to where we were when I said we would bring it up in other business, and that was asking Dr. Gilbert uh, to talk to our legislators. Now, we may as a board want to do this ourselves. Mr. Campbell had an excellent idea of us calling mm -hmm. or getting Dr. Gilbert to uh, do something. Can it's the board's both? wish. Huh? We can do both. You both. Okay. You can email all righty. Ms. Renee, you had a question. Well, I think that it would be excellent if Dr. Gilbert would facilitate, write a letter on behalf of the board, and then each of us do this individually as well. My concern right now is for the poor teachers who have struggled this year with so many new things, the new evaluation, and now suddenly this is going to be part of a public record. That's just not fair to them. Right. It's just not fair. Fair. Right. And I would encourage each and every one of us on the board in this room and every teacher sitting in your living room this evening to make some phone calls mm -hmm. to, to just instigate some kind of change. This is not fair to them. Um, teacher morale is pretty down in some places, and I think that with everything that's been thrown upon them, we just need to do all we can to boost them up, mm -hmm. and I think it's it's part of our job to do that. We all need everybody at home. Please call your legislators, and you know, no one would like your personal business or your personal evaluation or your doctor's lab reports or anything else given out to the public. Teachers don't need this done to them as either. So I would be the first one to write and call, and I hope everyone else will, and I hope Dr. Gilbert, you'll format some kind of letter on our behalf and and let's try to affect some kind of change this just isn't fair teachers are dealing with a hard time they're dealing with evaluations now they're going to be testing it's not fair for all of this to be rolled up into one little ball that somebody can go and say Susie Jones did this look at her test scores look at her evaluations it's not fair yeah. she's, she's absolutely right I don't say much, but she's right. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Camp. Two or three things in discussion and question and answer, Ralph. I'm assuming it's the same as it was two years ago. At the central office, you have a personnel file on every employee. I'm assuming. Yes, sir. Okay. Now, normally, evaluations... A teacher's class test scores, do they normally go into those personnel files? The summative, once they, when they get tenure, they do. Okay. All right. And personnel files that you have at the central office, 
anybody can walk in and say, I want to see Ralph Ringstaff's personnel file, and I've got to sign, and I think states why I'm looking at it, but it could be like personal reasons. So anything that is placed in that file at the central office is subject to public records, public knowledge. Yes, sir. Right? Whether it's an arrest record or whether it's something good that Written they did as well. Yes. And that has been for a long time. Yes. Correct? Yes, sir. Okay. I knew that's the way it was when I was involved in it. So what I don't I don't know what the the legislature is looking so hard at is making a test scores and evaluations. But right now, they can do that. But what what they're trying to do is to eliminate where people, the public, or anybody else can go in and look at those files. Am I correct? We're that's talking the way the bill is going new, right now. That's the discussion. Talking test scores. Uh, more specific for each teacher. It's okay. going to be more specific information for each teacher. But what what we're trying to get done is to defeat the idea that I can go in and look at your personnel file and your test records and evaluations. But other things like com commendations or letters of reprimand. All that will still be public All that record. will still be in there. So right yes. now we're just concerned about evaluations and test scores as well? Yes, sir. Although test scores are public knowledge anyway, aren't they? Not, not with your value added. And, and the yeah, difference, right, I think, right. here is that you're looking at, before, I think the evaluation, you didn't have the specificity that you have now. Now, and now it's a quantitative and qualitative. Then, in many ways, the old evaluation system was very qualitative. You didn't have test scores linked to that. So it was not a measure. When you put a number on a teacher, if I'm that teacher, you're putting a value on me. And that really bothers me a lot. And I think that's what bothers teachers. And I think that um, the other issue that we have is, again, what I alluded to previously, was that I was a music teacher. My score is not going to come from what I'm doing, but it's going to come from my school. Our pre-Ks are coming from our schools. Our, our K-1-2s are coming from those other teachers. And there's a real issue with that. Um, so I think that, that the idea that, that a teacher's evaluation with the evaluation system as it is now being out there really... Um, it almost feels like an invasion of privacy. The other thing is a director, the way I look at it. You have one employee, and that's Linda Gilbert. And by golly, you better hold Linda Gilbert responsible for what happens in these schools, and you all do. It's my job to hold the principals responsible and the teachers responsible. If I don't know well enough right now who, who the teachers are that are doing a great job and being effective with the students are, then you need to get rid of me today. But I do know who's effective, and it's my job to know who's effective. It's the principal's job to know who's effective. It is not necessarily the newspaper's job to know who's effective. I would also wonder whether or not if evaluations are public. Now let, let's just be honest, okay? Uh, my evaluation record of Susan Andrews, she's a fourth grade teacher. Now let's say that she's bordering on the line between a two and a three. What do you think I'm going to put down? Exactly, you're exactly right. You're going right. to put down a three, you know right. why? Because you want them to look as good as possible. Mm -hmm. And I think that when we start letting evaluations go public, we're going to find maybe not completely true evaluations. And the two legislators that I talked to, Saturday, agreed. In fact, they the ones told me. I agree as well. Yeah. yeah. And I think that's part of the problem. So, I, to sum it up, can, can, um, I'd like to move that we ask Dr. Gilbert to coordinate our efforts at getting some written documents to our um, legislators and uh, would ask her, too, if she wouldn't mind sending us the email addresses and phone numbers and 
we can take it individually from there. That sort of sum Good it up. Mm -hmm. I think it's important to I think it's important to um, recognize the way parents feel in this whole equation too, because no one can fault a parent for wanting the very best teacher that they can get for their child. And um, if they have questions or concerns, they need to share that with the, the principal. But no one can fault that, that parent. We all want that for our children. We want them to have the very best teacher that they can possibly get. And so when we're talking about all this, I want to make sure that we, don't, that, that we acknowledge that it's normal. And as parents, I mean, we, 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 want, we want that. And that's normal. And, but but um, and there, there's, if they have concerns, there are ways that they can you know, go and share their concerns with the principal. And, and, um, and you know, I'm sure that all of our principals listen, and they listen with an open ear. So um, I just want to make sure we acknowledge the parents in this. And, and I think you're right, and I think that's the way it should be. It, it should be that, that that parent can come talk to that principal, can talk to that teacher first and the principal. And I think with what we have on the report card, as far as the value added, as far as the achievement, I think there's enough information there that, that you, can, you can figure out what's happening. Um, what, I, what I would suggest, and what I'd, if you want me to follow up, what I will do is, is draft an email, because I think it is time is of the essence here and then follow it with a hard copy of that. But, but what I'm planning right now is, is uh, in copying you on that email. But I think it's important that that goes out tonight. All righty, thank you. She doesn't sleep anyway. <laughs> <laughs> there is a motion. Is there a second? Second. Oh, there's a motion and a second board. All in favor of Dr. Gilbert, Dr. Gilbert proceeding on tonight with that email and then follow up with a hard copy. Say aye. 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 Are there any that oppose? Hearing none, if there's no other business outside of, we know we have a retreat coming up and we have our policy sessions on the second Tuesday of the month. We will entertain a motion to adjourn. And that starts at 5 o'clock, am I correct? The pol next policy session? Yes. April the 10th okay. at 5 o'clock. So moved.